David Grush's former boss and guy who looks like he reads Tom Clancy novels with a legal pad and a highlighter, Colonel Carl Nell, spoke to a group of institutional investors in New York last week where he made a number of mind-melting statements, including, spoiler alert, the government doesn't really have a plan for disclosure and things could get a little messy between here and the post-disclosure world that we're all so excited to see. We're going to take a look at that video and break down some of the things that Carl Nell had to say in a new segment that I call Between the Lines. But before we do, if you are not already a subscriber, will you do me a favor and hit that subscribe button and help me grow this channel? Join Team Night Shift because by growing this channel, I can approach new and exciting guests and I can convince them to come here and talk to me and you about them. And that's going to help us understand what the f is going on because things are getting crazy out there. Full disclosure before we get started, I've only watched this video through one time and that was just so that I could jot down some loose notes on sort of the flow of conversation and what gets covered. I didn't watch it a second time because I wanted to wait until I had an opportunity to record a video so that we could unpack this together and that my reactions would be fresh and, and a little bit more relevant that way. I'm getting to this a few days late. This actually happened a week ago but uh, Memorial Day weekend happened in between then and the time I'm recording this and there was just a lot going on. So I finally had an opportunity to sit down and do this and I'm very excited to put this video together. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. I'm glad that we are the final talk of this year's SALT event. And I'm very excited to discuss what I consider to be one of the most consequential questions of our lifetime, which is, are we alone in the universe? And I'm very lucky to have Carl Nell here joining me for this conversation. Carl, thank you so much for coming. And Anthony and AJ over at SALT, thank you so much for, for hosting this. Uh, so, Carl, maybe to begin, can you share a little bit about your background, who you are, and perhaps why people should care what you say? Sure. Well, well thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. and It's a fantastic event, and uh, I, I'm glad to see uh, a large bunch of folks that stuck it out to the end for this, uh, for this talk. Uh, so I was fortunate. I had a, a four-year ROTC scholarship to Penn. I graduated uh, with a degree in electrical engineering. The Army uh, sent me overseas to do uh, Signal Corps engineering projects, so I did a lot of strategic comm projects in Europe. I ended up uh, working in Army Space Command. I commanded a satellite ground station, war trace to the Joint Chiefs. I spent some time at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The Army ultimately sent me to get a master's in mechanical engineering, a master's in strategic studies, graduate work in computer science. I was on track to stay in, uh, but I decided that I wanted to pursue more of a technical career. Uh, so I got out and ended up working at Bell Labs, uh, which was a fantastic place. Unfortunately, I was there during the trivestiture that uh, folks may be familiar with where the company got split up. I uh, left Bell Labs and ended up working in Lockheed Missiles in Space. Bell Labs is also one of the uh, many places that a lot of this ET tech supposedly wound up at. Uh, so if he worked there, there's a chance that he worked with some of this stuff. So I worked at Northrop Grumman. I've ran uh, strategic uh, technology programs in the defense industry, worked for a lot of the three-letter agencies, ultimately was a deputy chief of staff or deputy uh, CTO for a $2 billion company. I was a vice president general manager of a uh, Northern Virginia-based R&D firm. Uh, I stayed in the military, uh, uh, in the reserve. I commanded at every grade level through brigade. I was fortunate to stand up the Army's newest expeditionary MI brigade. I was the deputy chief of staff for a combatant command. Uh, ultimately, this experience sort of combined to give me the opportunity to come in and advise uh, Army uh, Futures Command, the largest reorganization in the Army Reserve uh, since, uh, since really 1973 on yeah. how the Army could be more effective. And uh, my last assignment uh, was involved with the UAP Task Force, which maybe is the most apropos. Uh okay, so if we ever, uh, if we haven't already, if we launch an official Stargate program, 
Nell is my top pick to run the program, just point blank. And um, with a resume like that, you have to take everything this guy has to say extremely seriously. So the fact that he's even having this conversation with a group of Wall Street hedge fund people, like the, the writing is on the wall. That, I, I think this conversation just got super serious. Let's go on. For this discussion. And, and so, Carl, here's, here's the million-dollar question. Do you believe that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet? Right. So non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new, and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. Well, let's go home, everybody. I guess we're done here. Uh, that's all I needed to hear. When this man tells you that that's what's going on, that's what's going on. Point blank. Carl, that is quite a bold statement. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm curious, how confident are you that that is true? There's zero doubt. And, and I love the way military guys communicate because they are so straight to the point and there is no bullshit. There is zero doubt. Zero. Okay, let's carry on. What evidence have you seen? What was the moment where you developed this level of conviction? Because what you're saying is extremely consequential and very important. And I know that a lot of people here even perhaps may not believe that statement. Right. Well, probably a better way to ask that is how can the folks in the audience come to the, you know, a uh, common understanding of what this phenomenon is? And so there's sort of two tracks here. One is from first principles and another is actually from the data. So, so let's take a look at the data. So we can look at some folks that have uh, very high level uh, access to information, like uh, Paul Hellyer, who is the Defense Chief for Canada, has come out and said the same thing. We can look at Ham Eshed, uh, the head of Israel's, or former head of Israel's Space Force, has said the same thing. Chris Mellon, Assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretary okay. for... So, we know to take Carl Nell seriously, but what Haim Eshed said and what Paul Hellyer said is an order of magnitude weirder than there's aliens and that we're in contact. Like Haim uh, if I'm remembering correctly, and, and check me on this, people, if you uh, can link to the specific statements that he's made, uh, put that in the comments. But Haim was the one who suggested that we were in contact with a galactic federation. Like those were his words. It was either Paul Hellier, Paul Hellier or Haim but galactic federation is on the table. That's Star Trek stuff. So now Carl Nell is telling us to start there. That's very interesting to me. Tell Sapco has essentially said the same thing. Lou Elizondo has said the same thing. David mm. Grush has said the same thing. David Grush cleared for presidentially level material. So you're looking at people that are in a position to know this and they're telling you the same thing. You could take a look at the Gang of Eight in the Senate and in Congress. So there's two members of the Gang of Eight, Marco Rubio and Senator Chuck Schumer, that signed up to the UAP disclosure amendment last year that basically said they're not being told the truth and we need to push forward on that. So that's sort of a, an overview of some of the, the And Rubio routinely would walk out of uh, briefings where he would just look like somebody hit him with a taser. He just looked like sweaty and confused. Most of these people at some point, or maybe even currently, have held very high clearances and high positions within our government. So you start at, you do ask yourself, like, what incentive would so many people with that kind of um, qualification, these are serious people, have to come forward and make something up? And I, I, it's not like I don't have a thing against Rubio, not specifically, but he just looked like somebody flipped his world and then sent him back out to talk to the press. And like I remember seeing interviews with him where he would go into these classified briefings and he would just come out and he'd be like, either everybody in our government is full of shit and all these people are lying at very high positions of power, which should be a huge problem for us, or we have some kind of crazy alien situation going on and that 
appears to be uh, what's going on. So um, it's interesting, Marco Rubio uh, working on this, uh, just watching him react. Yeah. From a first principle standpoint, what's so unusual about this um, realization? There's billions of stars in the galaxy. Life here evolved in 500 million years, which is basically a blink of an eye. We've found planets around every star that we've looked at. It's likely that the universe is full of life. If you look at the SETI program in particular, the SETI program has all the same assumptions that you would uh, accept and probably make uh, with respect to this topic, except that they believe that non-human intelligence is transmitting signals here. But at the same time, like we're not transmitting signals. Signal, city is, doesn't transmit signals. And the only signals that are actually broadcast of high enough power into space for somebody to pick up come from broadcast television and ballistic missile early warning systems, which you could argue our technology is moving away from. We're going to satellite, we're going to fiber. Broadcast TV is a thing of the past. And if you get to some state where society is stable, maybe we don't need ballistic missile early warning system. So, so the other guy is probably not going to. That's really interesting. Did you catch that? When we get, if we get to a point where society is stable, stable society would imply some type of a post-disclosure, post-scarcity world. And that's a very specific way of saying it. And it means that, uh, at least to me anyway, it suggests that he thinks about this in those terms. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and it's also interesting that he sort of avoids the direct question of like, do you have evidence of something uh, going on? And he kind of pivots to uh, the numbers and uh, the idea that SETI is kind of like ill-equipped to find the thing that we're all looking for because what they're looking for is a radio signal and the window of time that a civilization would be putting out radio signals strong enough to be picked up by a group like SETI is so small that it would look like from a cosmic perspective little blinking Christmas lights coming on and off. And if you're not looking at exactly the right one at exactly the right time, you might never know. So we could be surrounded by advanced civilizations, but because they're not transmitting all the time uh, for thousands of years and the, and the time that they're transmitting would have to overlap with the time that we're looking at that group of stars. Uh, that makes sense. So he's got some pretty strong criticism of the whole SETI approach. And I think that's accurate. Yeah. But what the other guy may do is come here if that's possible to do. And there's, there's physics models that suggest that that may be possible. And, and Carl, I mean, what you're saying is extremely consequential. And you've referenced other people that have said the same thing that also have similar credibility. Um, there's similar reasons for why we should believe many of these folks. Yet the government itself has not formally disclosed. They've been very reluctant to do that. Why? Why do you think that is? So th there's six basic reasons. And this, again, you could Real quick, before he goes into this next point, like the last thing that he said uh, was that there are physics models that suggest it's possible for uh, people or beings or NHI, whatever you want to call it, to physically travel from A to B across the vast distances of the cosmos in a fashion that would lead them directly to us rather than having to go through the securitist sort of uh, search that SETI is engaged in. And that that travel from point A to point B might just be uh, the better way to go and send uh, information back and forth. Okay, uh, let's let's go back to what do you draw this out from first principles. There's a national security reason. There's the lack of a plan. There's the potential for societal disruption. There's the possibility that there's some non-public agreement. There's the potential for misdeeds and the, and the desire to cover up misdeeds. And there's just the basic organizational intransigence and lack of priority that might be associated with the topic. So all these things are factors. The, the issue is that really the national security issue subsumes all the others. And so there's an opportunity maybe to, to contract the national security issue similarly to what was done with nuclear weapons and nuclear energy such that nuclear energy is not necessarily classified and is available to the public. But okay, first of all, I hate it when people say uh, nuclear. It's not nuclear, it's nuclear. It's nuclear. I know that, and I'm not a colonel. Come on, um, nuclear. Interesting point that he makes there about how nuclear was uh, super classified and then uh, basically like mostly declassified so that it could be used in a public way and he compares uh, non-human intelligence and NHI reverse engineering tech to that. 
which suggests to me that there is a commercial mindset at play here. Of course, considering the audience, he's speaking to hedge fund people and investors, venture capitalist people. Uh, that makes sense. He would probably try to, to, to sort of package it in those terms. And I think that if there is a pro-disclosure movement um, that is organized and it appears that that's what's going on, maybe this is a strategy. Maybe their strategy is to get Wall Street involved because Wall Street's the thing that's going to like blow the doors off of this and just make it into a money thing. That's what's going to really bring it out into the open. So it could be intentional from the groups on the inside, or maybe they want to make money off of it internally, and they're using Wall Street as a means to do that. I'm sure that's part of it. Or it could just be a tactic. Maybe that's the strategy. Like, just go after the big companies and get them involved in figuring out who's got what technology and then suing each other until it all comes out in some big protracted legal battle. And maybe that's what the catastrophic uh, side of this turns into. Lack of a plan and the potential for societal disruption are key ingredients that would prevent any responsible leader from coming forward with information that they don't have the means to address yeah. in a responsible way. It would be irresponsible to do that. Okay. Lack of a plan and the risk of a, of a, of a societal breakdown. Um, that's interesting because I think most people who have looked at this are basically like, uh, uh, okay with it. Like they wouldn't really freak out just with the basic understanding that we're not alone and they are here. I think most people are already kind of at that point. I think what they're really getting at though, is the economic meltdown that would happen. Economic meltdown and the trillions of dollars that would immediately evaporate once people realize that the system that we've built our entire existence off of, uh, this whole sort of crazy financial consumerist system that we've built is just silly and it's a house of cards and there's technology that that supersedes all of that that would make all of that irrelevant um that would make people opt out of the consumer culture and that is probably the true fear when they say collapse or they say societal breakdown or the ramifications i'm sure that on a on an individual level a lot of people would have a hard time with this but i think broadly speaking we've been through things as a species before that are crazy and difficult to deal with and we've dealt with them and we've moved on um, I think that this would be like that, probably on a bigger scale, but it would be survivable. Um, but it's it ends the paradigm that we're in. The paradigm that we're in is over and we enter a new energy paradigm. And the new energy paradigm is something that Danny Sheehan has talked about. Uh, many people have talked about this. And I think that's what's at bottom here. Who's, who, who's going to control this new energy paradigm? And again, that makes sense. If you were pitching to a bunch of Wall Street people, that might be the way to lead uh, the conversation. We have this technology. We know where it is. We can probably get our hands on it. And it shouldn't really be only locked up in one, in the hands of one corporation. So let's make this happen however we have to make it happen. And then Wall Street can just step in and throw millions and millions of dollars at it. Uh, attorneys all their Harvard law guys at it and then um, let the games begin. And eventually all this stuff will come out. Just a thought, just a hypothesis. I'm just throwing that out there, just spitballing. So what you're saying is that you have absolute conviction that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet, that there are factions within our own government that know about this, yet we still don't have a plan and they may uh, represent a security issue. This may be, this may pose a threat to humans, yet you still believe that we should disclose. Is that right? Correct. Right. So, so there's really three reasons that trump all those others. And those others are basically valid, like I said. So the first issue is the moral right. The, the government exists for and by the people. And so the nature of reality is fundamentally not government information. People have a right to know the world in which we, we live, and the pursuit of happiness requires that knowledge. So that's sort of the first kind of overarching philosophical foundation for this. But you know, as a corollary to that, if there are misdeeds that were done, then they need to be remediated. If there's lack of proper oversight, which is suggested by some of the whistleblowers, that needs to be remediated. So the first issue is the moral issue. The second issue is being in a reactive mode is never preferable to being in a proactive mode. So a reactive mode is basically trying to prevent disclosure. But 
Failing that, you might get a situation where you have catastrophic disclosure that creates all the problems that you were trying to is. prevent. So a more balanced middle path of controlled disclosure is the best way to do this, which is, again, an argument for some amount of disclosure. And the third... That's really interesting. So um, catastrophic disclosure, that sounds like what it sounds like what he's suggesting is somebody else could move first. Somebody else could make an early move that might destabilize the situation and that whoever moves first is going to be in control. So therefore, the case is we should move first. And that makes a lot of sense. It's simply uh, societal advance and uh, global competitiveness. More brain trust needs to be brought into this topic in order to make progress and to improve society. And, and so all three of those things together trump the six other reasons for non-disclosure. I also think it's interesting that he said uh, if there were misdeeds that were done, they need to be remediated. That's a very neutral term, remediated, but uh, I'm on board with that. Yeah, if there were misdeeds, they need to be accounted for, but there might be a lot of deal making in between here and there. And maybe that's what it boils down to. Maybe they turn this into some kind of like hostage negotiation where they're like, look, we'll give you the technology, but we want full immunity and we want a piece of the action. Maybe that's how this is going to go down. I don't know. When Wall Street bros get involved, like all bets are off. Like they will make new laws. They will change the law. They'll, they, they own this fucking place and we work for them. And that's the deal. Um, George Carlin said it best. Like they own it. They own all the important land. They own everything. They own the media. They are the center of power in this country. And when, uh, if you remember the Occupy Wall Street protests uh, years ago, Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street. Why wasn't it Occupy Congress? It was Occupy Wall Street because that's where the power is. And they understood that. And, and what do you think happens if we don't disclose? I, I know you mentioned this idea of catastrophic disclosure. Uh, maybe disclosure may be forced upon us. Uh, how do you think about that? So the situation is usually thought of as, as a binary state. It's like an all or nothing. Uh, and people have sort of argued this. But anybody paying attention realizes the government has already indicated that unidentified anomalous phenomena are real, they're not ours, and they're not our adversaries. The, the Pentagon has said that. Like, for people that are paying attention, like, that shoe already dropped. So... Mic drop. A lot of people, they think that the second shoe to drop is this is non-human intelligence, and you know, maybe the conversation stops there. Like, the president comes out and says, you know, uh, there's non-human intelligence. The truth is that that will precipitate this crescendo of other questions that maybe the government's not ready to answer. That will court, if not precipitate, potential negative ramification for society. And so as an example of this, I would actually point to something from the ancient past, the, the Bronze Age collapse. So Eric Klein, Princeton University, 2015, wrote a very interesting book called 1177 BC, the age that civil, the year that civilization failed. And so this is well known to, to current scholarship. Within a single lifetime, all of the very effective ancient civilizations of the Bronze Age failed due to a confluence of reasons that are not necessarily fully understood today. So we're talking about Egypt, the Hittite Empire, the Minoan Empire, the Manassean Empire, the Babylonian Empire. All these civilizations failed never to return, other than, let's say, Egypt. And so these were highly sophisticated civilizations with highly developed infrastructures, highly developed uh, administrative states. They were globalist, in a sense, very similar to today in terms of the known world, the known Near East. They were economically interdependent. They had uh, uh, both diplomatic ties and commerce ties. And yet these civilizations failed in a single lifetime because of stressors that these civilizations collectively could not address within, yeah. uh, within the time frame. And so if we look at our society today, uh, one might argue that it's similarly fractured, similarly under economic stress, similarly under um, cultural stress as well, you know, fractured uh, and fragile diplomatic situation. It mirrors very much this scenario. Yeah. And, and so for a responsible decision maker, that is certainly a factor. Oh, wow. That's a lot to unpack. Um... 
it sounds like to me, he's saying that we have reached a level of civilizational complexity that is no longer uh, tenable and that the system is unstable to a degree that suggests collapse is either inevitable or highly likely. And that in order for us to move from this unstable system into something more stable, we have to be ready to let go of the paradigm uh, the way that we understand it and embrace something new. But there might be a way to do that in a controlled fashion that allows us to transition without destroying ourselves. That's what I'm reading between the lines. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let's carry on. And so I, I guess when you say that, um, are you implying that perhaps we as a society may not be ready for disclosure? Or, or are you saying that we may I don't not think be Wall able Street's to defend ourselves disclosure. against this other force? So there's sort of different viewpoints on, you know, whether people are ready to, um, you know, deal with this phenomenon. And, you know, popular culture is kind of infused with this stuff. Roswell became a meme a long time ago. We got programs on ancient aliens, Skinwalker Ranch, all this stuff. I guess I would draw an analogy, though, for people that believe in a certain faith tradition, whatever that faith tradition is, and hold to that and subscribe to that in a very serious and devout way, and, and you know, sort of pose the question, even for folks of that ilk, and I would count myself as one, if the, you're confronted with the reality of your religious belief system, like the reality of the metaphysical, uh, an angel, a, a messenger from God, what have you, that's going to be a sea state change in your, in your way of dealing with reality, right? Even though you already believe it, right? So it's one thing to believe and it's another to know. Mm. And I think in this context, this, this phenomena has a, an analogous, the potential for an analogous effect, both on the individual and on society. Yeah. There, we see this a lot. Like the, you, no one, people who are in positions to know more than the average person about this phenomenon and what's going on with it always seem to come back to a weird conversation about religion. They always circle back to religion. I don't think he's just saying like fundamentalist believers are going to flip out when they find out there are aliens. That's, that doesn't sound like the direction he's taking this. It sounds to me more like he's saying this is on that level. It's at that scale. And that he's suggesting maybe that those two, that UFOs as we think of them, UAPs, non-human intelligence and religion may be more closely associated with one another than we are comfortable uh, acknowledging at this stage. And that this disclosure is going to come at the cost of a lot of people having to reevaluate their worldview, which I think is fair, but it's interesting how the religious thing always comes back into it, especially considering how recently and how frequently the Vatican comes out and make statements regarding all this stuff. Um, they seem to be at the very forefront of all of this uh, as well. Very interesting. That the phenomena, this non-human form of intelligence represents a threat to humanity. So, so this is a good question too. And some of the other folks have sort of framed things in that, in that light. And I guess I would suggest that if we're the, the universe is governed by conservation laws, and it's probably reasonable to assume the laws of nature that we understand uh, apply everywhere. We may have incomplete understanding, undoubtedly we, we do, of these laws, but they're sort of homogeneous and they apply throughout the universe. And so those laws are governed by conservation rules. There's conserved quantities. And so this reality really forces a Darwinian type competition in order uh, to survive. And so it's reasonable to assume any other civilization that's evolved has come up through the same Darwinian evolutionary process. So I think it's naive to expect complete altruism and, until and unless you get to a, post, a state of post-scarcity, where, where you, you essentially have no uh, you know, physical needs uh, that we're kind of encumbered with in, in, in this universe. Excellent points. And I really like the way that he approaches this. Very level-headed, very clear-minded. There is no real reason why we should assume that all non-human intelligences would just automatically be um, benevolent. So there's a, 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 a possibility that there is a threat and we should treat it as if that is real. I think that's very wise. 
I don't know where this idea originated, but somewhere way back when this concept of like the love and light brigade, that this was all just like, it was going to be smooth sailing. And all we have to do is, is let our guard down and just say, Hey, welcome to earth. Uh, and we're all going to be fine. And it's going to be wonderful. I don't buy it. I just don't. It's, if you look at our own history of uh, more advanced civilizations coming into contact with less advanced civilizations on this planet, it never ends well. It never, ever, ever ends well. And there is no reason to believe that just because one group has more advanced technology, uh, that that is going to somehow improve their morality. He's also suggesting that whoever we are going to be dealing with, or whoever we may already be dealing with, is probably the apex predator on their world right? We're the apex predator on this world. If we deal with a species or a race of beings from another world, they're going to be the apex predator on that world. And so we should be cautious, totally on board with that until we get to, or or until said group gets to a post-scarcity place in their development. Post-scarcity meaning like Star Trek world where you no longer have a limitation on like the basic necessities of life, that those are basically unlimited and freely available. And there's no pressure to compete, at least in the way that uh, there is now in our society here on earth. Since it's the economics of the future that are going to determine whether there's cooperation, competition, or some kind of symbiosis yeah. and um, inform the intention, but to assume either malintent or complete altruism, I think is somewhat naive. Yeah, so, so it sounds like what you're saying is it's impossible to know the true intentions of a higher intelligence. We may be competing for the same scarce resources. We may not be, right? We may be almost irrelevant, from them, uh, irrelevant to them, and they may be acting altruistically, although we cannot safely assume that. And so I guess I'm, I'm curious, if we continue down this disclosure path, do you believe that disclosure is inevitable? So, again, people that sort of look at this topic and study it, and there have been some, some good um, examinations on this from a f- historical standpoint, have realized that, like, we're not in a, really a new state. Like, this sort of disclosure emphasis has come and gone over time. And so this is not the first time we've arrived at this stage. I, I, I would suggest that maybe the peak of this current cycle happened last December with the Schumer Amendment and then it got rolled back, it was defeated in the House. And so it remains to be seen, you know, if the process is going to continue. One yeah. hopes and, and can maybe draw a little bit of um, uh, confidence that maybe this will come around is the colloquy that uh, Senator Schumer and Senator Rounds had back in December. After their amendment got killed, they basically went on the Senate floor and articulated their rationale for the legislation And I think uh, Senator Schumer, to quote him, almost said it was a travesty that this did not pass. So this is, you know, a bipartisan colloquy on a topic that I guess most people would probably consider fringe. And yet these two senators felt the need to do that and to double down on their uh, desire to see this through. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see maybe a reintroduction of some version of that this summer uh, with the goal of maybe putting it into the NDAA by the end of the year. The big theory, I think, that, that most people subscribe to, at least, or, uh, that makes the most sense to me, is that um, Congress found out that they're really not in control of a lot of what's going on. And they've been left completely out of the loop on some really serious stuff that they should not have been left out of the loop on. And they don't like when control and power are taken away from them, so they want to get it back. And uh, I think that that's why this conversation has moved from a government zone, government only zone into this sort of quasi commercial, quasi finance, Wall Street sort of zone, um, because the centers of power around this technology uh, are are reorganizing themselves in relationship to this uh, technology as the understanding that it is real and tangible and accessible becomes more and more widespread. You're starting to see people uh, pick sides and and figure out uh, what side of this uh of this battle they want to be on it sounds like inevitably we're going to get to some some post-disclosure situation and when that happens the paradigm will have to necessarily shift and maybe that's the thing that maybe there's a fortune to be made in that transition and maybe that's the whole 
the whole point here. I know I keep beating that drum, but I just, for some reason, that just feels true to me. Narrative that the United States leads on the disclosure efforts? So this is an interesting question, too, because this is a global phenomenon, and it's affecting uh, other countries just like the United States. The reporting on this is clear over decades. Other countries have reported this stuff. And, and not only that, you know, the Vatican has come out and, and made statements uh, that reference or tangentially reference this topic. So organized religion has a say in this topic as well. So it's really a whole of planet, whole of humanity problem. And so the U.S. has got its role to play, but these other countries have their role to play, and it would behoove us to recognize that, that uh, you know, U.S. action could be pre preempted by another party. There it is. U.S. action could be preempted by another party. China could uh, announce a functional anti-gravity craft, and they could achieve a sudden uh, dominance in space at a time when we think we dominate space. And maybe they one-up us in a huge way, and that sets off an entirely new situation. Or maybe the Vatican does something first. I doubt it, but it would be really interesting if the Vatican just came out and made an announcement. That would be fascinating. So, I don't know. More conducive to work collectively. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that I don't fully understand that I'd love to get your thoughts on, Carl, I mean, if we assume that a higher form of non-human intelligence has been visiting this planet, if we assume that some of the statements made by folks like Dave Grush are true, that we have crash materials, and if we assume that those craft that we may have exhibit characteristics that defy our current understanding of physics, it would, it would seem that that technology would provide an incredible strategic advantage to whatever nation ends up reverse engineering it first. And so, to me, that would imply that there is a race happening to reverse engineer this, and that this topic would be a top priority. Do you agree with that? So I think Good some question. of what you say is a reasonable conclusion to be drawn. And I've suggested something similar in, in past statements. The so that means yes. Just reading between the lines, he's saying yes. There is a Cold War going on between countries to see who can reverse engineer this stuff uh, as fast as possible and get to it first. Okay. Here, though, is to go from a pre-disclosure to a post-disclosure world, maybe two stable states that are separated by an unstable middle ground. And so how you make that transition, again, you know, this speaks to the concern about this catastrophic uh, disclosure. And this has come up in sort of arms regulation too, mutually assured destruction, however much we don't like it, is sort of a stable kind of, you know, geostrategic regime. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Reagan era defense shield idea is also a very stable scenario, but to go from one to the other is very unstable. Yeah. And so this topic sort of mirrors that. Yeah. Wow. So things could get a little messy. That's interesting. And uh, stable state A and stable state B. Stable state A, where we're at today, kind of stable, but rapidly destabilizing. And then stable state B sounds like he's kind of thrown it out there. A post-scarcity world, maybe. I'd like to see that, wouldn't you? Um, wow. What would we do? A post-scarcity world with a really messy transition period in between, during which a lot of money could be made if the right people got in control of the right technology at just the right time to begin rapidly decarbonizing our industry, uh, geoengineering our planet, practicing some kind of like deploying a, a major solar management program to reflect the sun. This is all stuff that's actually being looked at right now because of how out of control the climate situation is. I know I keep coming back to this, but I definitely think these things are very related. And I believe that's what's pushing all of this forward. Uh, so that sounds like what I'm hearing, that uh, there's a lot of money to be made in the transition, but we've got to do it first. We have to lead the way to maintain control. And if we don't, we could lose control and that would be catastrophic for us. And I, and I, I know you and I were talking earlier about this idea that in order to really understand the phenomena, it's likely that we have to further our understanding of reality itself. And I guess I'm wondering, I can imagine a future where we acknowledge and we know that there is a higher form of non-human intelligence, yet we still don't truly understand 
the phenomena. We still don't truly understand reality. And so I guess I'm wondering, do you think that we'll ever truly understand what's going on? Or if part of the game, part of the journey, part of life itself is operating in an environment where at least part of it is fundamentally unknowable to us? So this is a totally philosophical, epistemological question, right? Really about the nature of knowledge itself, right? Like, how can we know what we know and how can we be sure about what we know? I, I guess personally, I subscribe to the idea that there is an ultimate truth and that uh, humanity being you know, created in the image of a, a higher power is endowed with the quality to pursue an understanding of that. And so our, our you know, part of our uh, objective in this existence is is to, to seek that out and try to understand that, that ultimate truth to a greater and greater degree. And uh, this would be a component of that, obviously. Yeah. That was fascinating. Um, man, also, it's, could you, like, when you look at Carl Nell, do you, do you notice when he is asked a very complex but direct question, he has no hesitation. He goes straight into a very detailed, nuanced answer. This man is super intelligent. You look at his eyes, like he is, he is functioning at a very high speed and it's totally, it's awesome to watch. Um, this is just really, a, he's a great communicator and he does a, a fantastic job of uh, making his case. So I I don't know, I think a guy with his level of credibility and his pedigree and his uh, resume uh, presenting this information in such a direct, frank, open uh, format to a group of Wall Street people, to me, signifies a huge shift that this thing has now moved into a new, a new, uh, we've moved into a new level. The Schumer Amendment failing when that sort of failed in Congress, that uh, put us on the back foot for a little bit, but this appears to be a change in tactics, a change in strategy. Now, it could just be that they invited him to speak and they paid his speaking fee and he came out and he, he did the presentation. But even that, if that's all that it is, still signifies that Wall Street is now seriously looking at this. And the only reason Wall Street looks at anything seriously is because they are hungry to make that money. They wanna make that dollar. So uh, I'm convinced that we're in a new phase. I wanna know what you think. Let me know in the comments. And um, again, if you haven't already, Please like and share this video. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps me grow the channel. That helps me uh, produce the show and make more content, interview better guests, and uh, just have a better time doing this. And uh, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this today. Thank you for being a part of Team Night Shift. I will see you on the next one. Please light me up in the comments. Let me know what you think. Uh, I wanna hear your thoughts. And I will see you on the next one. Until then, keep looking up.